Okay, welcome to our first weekly recording. Uh, in this, I'm basically wanting to go over some of the basics for problem analysis and problem solution. So this is really just about problem solving in general. Uh, some of this will probably be new to you unless you've been doing a bunch of competitive programming. Um, none of this is really algorithmic. So this is more about how to get uh, problems solved and that sort of thing. And I'm guessing that we'll have a second thing that I'll record this week that goes a little bit more into data structures and that sort of stuff. But at least for now, this is the main topic. So I want to talk a little bit about problem statements. So when you look at one of these problems that, that you've seen in lab and that you saw in the, uh, in the problem sets, the first thing to do is go through and read the problem and identify what the important information is that's needed. And you've already seen some examples of this. Uh, but the idea is you need to read through and see what is the problem actually asking because there's usually a story associated with it just like, um, you know, in the real world they're not kind of these silly stories like we have in the problems. Uh, they're real things that happen and you need to figure out what the computational issue is that you're really looking for in that. Um, and try to ignore the things that are not actually relevant to the problem. And then read through the details. So figure out exactly what the input and the output is asking for. A lot of times people will read through and assume that what's being asked for without reading exactly what's being said in the input and the output. And that can make a big difference. Sometimes the range of values that you have to, that you have to handle in the input really change the way you'll approach the problem. Uh, and likewise, the output, sometimes it needs to be formatted a particular way. And sometimes in the output statement, it will give you information that might not have been clear otherwise uh, and tell you things that you don't have to do or that you do have to do. Um, you also want to examine the sample input and output. So there's always an example input and output. Part of that is just a sort of a sanity check to make sure that you're doing what needs to be done. But a lot of times the sample input and output will really clarify what's going on. Uh, so if you're having trouble understanding the problem, looking at the sample input and output and kind of working through one of those and making sure you understand why the output is what it is, uh, is, is good to do. Usually the sample input and output, at least one or two of the cases, if they give multiple cases, sometimes not all of them, but at least one or two, will be things that you can do by hand, that you can verify by hand. Um, and the, the output will also sometimes answer some things that might be ambiguous, like, oh, how do I handle such and such a case? And if you look at the sample output, it will give you an example of that. Now, some of the things that you'll see um, uh, are that there's a variety of ways that input tends to be specified. Um, so some of the problems are kind of a one case only. So they just give you one scenario, you read that in, and you handle it. Um, other ones will sort of ask you to repeat something and you keep doing different operations re repeatedly or you handle a bunch of different scenarios. Um, and in those cases, there's a few different ways that they can specify them. Sometimes they'll say, they'll like one of the first things you'll read in is a number saying how many scenarios there are. Like, you know, you will have up to 10 cases and read in the first line and that will tell you how many cases and then following will be each of the cases. Um, so sometimes you'll read in a number that gives the size of the input. You'll also see that sometimes with an array of numbers, say. The first thing you'll read is the size of the array or how many numbers there are, and then uh, you'll get the list of numbers after that. Um, sometimes you'll be asked to read until a specific value is encountered. It'll just say, you know, keep reading data until you get something that is of size zero. Um, so, you know, it, maybe each data set starts with a number saying how many items are in that data set, and you're supposed to continue until you get a data set with size zero. And almost always you don't process the zero case. That's just the flag that tells you it's time to stop. Um, and then the other thing that you sometimes run into is uh, they won't specify the end of the input. It'll just say, here's a file. Um, now, notice we're not reading from files in these competitive programming contests. It's always from standard input and, and the output goes to standard output. Um, and so you're wanting to check in C++, this is CN, um, but you can actually check for end of file even on CN, just like with any other stream. Um, and so if the EOF, if CN.EOF as a function call is true, uh, that means that you have reached the end of the file. And specifically what that means is that you have already reached the end of the file. 
Um, and so that means that you have to try to read something in before that flag is true. So until you actually try to read something in that's not there and actually read that end of file uh, character, uh, it's not going to get flagged as true. So um, as an example, if you have a file that's you know empty, that it, there's, there's just nothing in it, then you try to read in some number um, then you can check and see if cn.eof is true, and and that will be the case, and nothing will have been read in. It would be, um, you know, it would be like you're trying to read something in. So that sometimes takes a little bit of practice, but if you ever run into cases where there's not an end of input specified, that's how you handle it. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so. Um, one of the other things is when you're looking at input, you need to identify the size that's there. So um, often there will be limits given saying, you know, things will be maximum this size or whatever. Um, and one thing I would mention is you need to always be able to handle those limits, but that can also tell you kind of something that you can allocate statically. So sometimes it's okay to you know, say allocate something of the maximum possible size and you just don't use it all. Um, and then you can sort of hard code what that maximum size is. Other times you might want something that you uh, actually specify what the size is. Um, but I would say regardless, be careful about extra allocation and deallocation. If you are dynamically allocating and deallocating, that sometimes creates a time sync, uh, you know, especially if it's done inside of a loop. Um, just be careful of it. Uh, if you're doing this through a nicely implemented class like in C++ if you're using the vector template that's okay um, even though it is doing dynamic memory allocation uh, it, it does it nicely it manages it well so you don't need to worry much about using vector for instance um, as you're doing your computation you always want to think about what size is needed not just on your input but in terms of intermediate computation and in your output uh, so there are cases where you will read in a bunch of integers, but if you read in, you know, say, you know, just say you have a bunch of integers and all the integers are no bigger than a million, um, but you might have a million integers and you're supposed to find the sum. Well, guess what? That sum might overflow your integer class. So um, in that case, you'd, you'd need to use a long long instead of just a plain integer. And so just keep that in mind that sometimes even though the individual things that you read in might fit within a standard 32-bit integer, you might need a 64-bit integer um, for your intermediate or final computation. And, and if you're using Python, that'll be handled automatically. Uh, but if you're using C++, you need to make sure that you declare things as long longs. And uh, sometimes that'll even affect the algorithm that you need to use to solve it. So if you know the size of the data that you're reading in, that changes, you know, whether an n-squared algorithm is, is feasible or not, for instance, or if you need n log n. Um, just uh, as to give you an idea, and I don't expect you to look at all of this immediately, um, but there are a few things in C++ that are guaranteed as far as the sizes of various, uh, various data types. Um, but in practice, kind of the way to think about it is normally if you have a character, uh, char, car, however you learned it, um, that's typically 8 bits. A short int is 16 bits. If you have an int or a long int, it's 32 bits. And a long long is typically 64 bits. Um, and if you need something more than that, you either need an arbitrary precision library, which unfortunately is not currently implemented as part of the C++ standard. Uh, in Java, there is a big num library that's standardized as part of the distribution, and it's automatic in Python. Uh, so just keep that in mind uh, if, you, if you're really going to need those larger numbers. Um, and keep in mind sometimes that the order of operations can affect the size you need. Uh, if you multiply two numbers together that are that can be a maximum of, a, of an integer, the product might need to fit in a long long uh, as, as an example. Uh, and then even if you divide something later and it becomes smaller, keep in mind that that intermediate computation might have needed more digits of precision. Okay, um, if you are uh, if you are programming, what I would say is the standard libraries that are included with a language are your friends. You should make use of them. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next lecture topic, which deals with standard data structures. Um, but basically, like in C++, make use of the STL. Uh, I understand that 
in 121 these days, the STL is not as emphasized as it might have been in the past, uh, but that is something as a C++ programmer you should be very familiar with is the use of the STL. There's a reason it's the standard template library. Um, so templates are an important part of C++. This is the standard library that's included. It'll basically always be available when C++ is available. Um, and so there is, a, there is a trick that is used in a lot of competitive programming uh, that allows you to just import all of the standard C++ libraries, so all the stuff you would ever normally need. Um, you can pound and include bits slash stdc++.h. And pretty much that header will then include all the other headers. Uh, and then if you also add on using namespace standard so that you don't have to, you know, put std colon colon in front of various things, uh, that's going to save you a lot of typing. So it is super, super, super common to use these in competitive programming. Uh, I will say, you know, in terms of software development as a whole, when you go to work at a company, this is not what you should do. You generally shouldn't import any libraries, even standard ones that you don't need. Uh, so just import the stuff that you need uh, and, uh, and don't ex import extraneous stuff. That just opens you up to more and more problems. Um, but for competitive programming, it's a simple way to just get everything in. And likewise, you should be careful about the use of namespaces in, uh, in kind of real software development. Uh, but again, for competitive programming, it, you know, you're usually using standard libraries. You don't have other libraries that you're making use of. You were, you were writing small little snippets of code, so it's a whole lot faster to just write that. Just realize when you're doing it, you are taking some shortcuts that might not be the things you want to do uh, in a professional environment later on. Okay. Um, Reading in lines, so uh, at least in Python, it's normal to read in a line as a string, so the input always comes in as strings. Uh, but in C++, that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you do need to actually read a whole line at a time because of the way that the input is specified. You know, it'll, it'll be specified in different ways, and you have to process it in different ways. And you can't always say, oh, I know I've got an integer followed by a string followed by a floating point number. Uh, sometimes it'll vary depending on one of those things, and so a line of input could, could change around quite a bit. Um, so sometimes you'll find it easier to read a whole line and process it. Uh, I'll just say that sometimes a string stream is a good way of handling that. So you read an entire line into a string uh, using a read line and then uh, use that in a string stream and process it as you need to uh, from there. Uh, so that's, that's one way of going about it. Um, keep in mind that if you ever have something that fails reading on the input stream, then your CN is, becomes false. Uh, and so if you ever do that, you know, say you think you're going to read three things in and you only read two and, you know, something breaks or you're try, you try to read a, a number and it's a string, uh, then you, if you get this, if you get a failure in there, you can reset CN. You can do CN.clear to resume reading. Um, generally, I would not recommend doing that. Try to process without having to, having to fail things. So even if it means a little bit more code. Okay, one thing to keep in mind if you are kind of mixing in uh, reading in an entire line with something like get line uh, and reading in other things with just standard uh, stream operation of CN is when you read a number in uh, C++, you just read in one token and you don't read what comes after that. So basically the stream, the sort of the cursor you can think of it is stopped right before uh, the next thing. Um, and so imagine that you have something that has just a 10 on one line, and so then it's followed by a line break, and then there's another number on the next line. Well, if you read in A, and you read in the 10, it, A is going to have the value 10. Okay, but what does not happen is the line break after the A has not technically been read. Okay, it's just sort of stopped before that. And if you read in another number, you know, it skips over the line break, it skips over the white space and reads in the next number uh, that's there, basically the next token. Um, but unfortunately, the get line doesn't do that. It's going to read in everything through the line break. So if you call get line on CN after reading in the 10, it's going to read in an empty string because it's basically reading in that line break that was sitting after the 10 in your input. Uh, in your input. 
Um, and then if you call get line again, now it reads the next line. Uh, so sometimes you have to either throw an extra get line in if you're going to mix stuff between CN and get line, or if you're going to, uh, if another way to do this is just don't use the streaming from CN, just use get line for everything. So there's a few ways around that. Just realize this is something that I know it's caught me and I've seen it catch several students before. Uh, just be careful about mixing those two things together. Um, kind of on the other side of things, the output. When you are writing output in your programs, you need to remember to flush the output. Um, now for CN and Cout, uh, it's normally going to, when you call one, it's going to flush the other one automatically. C out, every time you do a new line, it's going to, you know, ENDL, if you stream that out, it's going to flush it as soon as that gets written. Um, but you can also call C out dot flush anytime you need to, if you want to go ahead and flush whatever the output is. And by flushing it, what that means is it, it prints it to the screen or sends it, you know, out um, as if it's printing to the screen. Um, so it, it empties the, the buffer. Uh, but up until the time that the buffer gets flushed basically it's got it's storing up what's ready to print and then it and then it prints it um, so so keep that in mind that you sometimes need to use flush uh, the other thing about output is sometimes things need to be formatted and string streams can be a useful way of doing this you can sort of format everything you want to into a string and then output the string uh, I find that easier to do myself sometimes um, I'll also mention that C++, remember it incorporates all of the standard C input-output stuff. So sometimes using printf, uh, that's the C style command for output, uh, is actually a little bit easier to format your data. I find especially if I've got a bunch of numerical data that I want to format in just the right way, uh, that's going to be the easier route to go than using C out. Um, and likewise, scanf, you can actually do some kind of regex type stuff in, in scan, using scanf that's not available with cn. Um, so sometimes you'll find it easier to use uh, scanf and printf. If you're not familiar with printf and scanf, which most people wouldn't be as, uh, when you learn C++, uh, you can go back and learn about them in, from C. Uh, it's basically function calls to do printing and, and reading in input. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that if you want to become particularly proficient at, uh, at programming and understanding all the different options available. Uh, but the truth is most of the time you can do what you need to with C in and C out. You just need to sometimes be careful about the formatting. All right, so the other thing that we need to think about is precision. Um, on, in terms of output. So you'll see a lot of problems where it'll talk about uh, this needs to be correct within you know 10 to the minus 6th or 10 to the minus 3 or whatever. Um, and if you ever see that, that means that you need to make sure that you are outputting at least that much precision. Uh, sometimes it'll have both an absolute and a relative uh, precision measure and so sometimes if it's relative you don't actually need all of it but for the most part it's just the safe practice to make sure you're outputting a little bit more than that so if it says it needs to be accurate 10 to the minus 6 go ahead and output seven digits after the decimal point just to make sure you're you've got plenty of precision there now in C++ the easy solution for this if you're using standard C out is uh, you have to pound include the IO manip library a lot of people don't aren't really familiar with that, but IOMANIP lets you change the precision that your floating point numbers are output with. It also lets you change a bunch of other things. And then you just stream a couple of things to see out before the number that you want to print with certain precision. So you see out fixed, that'll guarantee fixed precision. It says you're going to output that much precision um, after the decimal. And then you see out set precision with whatever the amount is, and it's going to set that It'll, it'll give you that many digits of precision on the output. Now in Python, if you're a Python programmer, uh, you can use the format command. Um, if you're not familiar with it, format will let you change the number of digits that, uh, that are output. Uh, it, it basically creates a string from a number and it takes in two parameters. The first one's the number. Uh, the second one is a string that tells you how to format it. And so uh, the format, it gives you the width, which is how many characters you want it to be printed in. So like, you know, if you want to line it up in a table or something. Uh, but then there's a dot, decimal point, and after the decimal point is, the, is precision, followed by a letter. And the letter is commonly F, 
uh, that, that shows that you've got like fixed precision. Uh, but sometimes you use E if you want exponential or G, which is something more general. Um, and, and, but basically like if you wanted to have seven digits of precision, you might write uh, 0.7F and that'll guarantee that you have seven digits of precision afterward in, in the format command. Now, there are cases where you have a lot of input and output, and by this I mean typically it's something where you read a line of input and you write a line of output. You read a line of input, you write a line of output. And the problem with that is every time that you are making this switch between input and output, there's a whole bunch of system calls going on. Uh, basically context switching in terms of the operating system so that it's going to know, okay, I've got to output, I've got to input. And if you're just, you know, doing this occasionally, it's no big deal. Uh, but if you keep switching back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, there is a whole lot of overhead in the operating system itself uh, from doing that. Sometimes that can make your programs run too slow, that all on its own. And again, this happens when you have a whole lot of input that you're reading in, a lot of input, and especially if you have to keep writing output in between. So there are some kind of standard lines, a lot of people who do competitive programming a lot, you think of these almost as just the magic lines that you put in there uh, to make your input and output faster. Um, but they're just to make sure you know what they are. The first one is this iOS sync with standard IO false. And basically this means that you're um, separating out the different streams from each other so that one thing is not necessarily flushing the other one automatically. Um, and, and same thing with, sorry, same thing with the next line, cin.ty and cout.ty by setting them to false, that's going to make sure that your input and output don't automatically flush the other one. And so that way you can keep reading, 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 um, and, and writing and writing, and it's not automatically going to flush everything at the very, uh, you know, at every stage in between. It'll just do it either when the buffer's full or, uh, or when you call a flush or something like that. Um, if you ever have an interactive problem, which I don't really anticipate us having in this class, except maybe as a uh, challenge type problem, but if there's ever an interactive problem, that's usually something where you have to read data and write something out, and then read and then write something. You're sort of interacting with the judge computer, and uh, in those cases, you really have to control your input and output. Well, you need to be careful about doing that in these cases, but the, basically, the more control you want, this, this is a way of getting that control. If you're curious about how all this works, you can look into the details of how, how those commands work. Um, but the basic idea is that you're, you're stopping, uh, in one case, you're stopping the standard C streams from interfering with the C++ ones um, so that uh, they're not like causing the other one to, to generate uh, system calls when they don't need to. The other one is is unlinking the uh, the C in and C out from each other so that uh, they don't cause each other to uh, to cause system calls when you call the other one. Okay, um, we're going to talk more about testing a little bit as we go through the course, um, but I do want to mention a little bit about this just as something to think about in terms of your programs. Um, so the first thing to realize, and you should have realized this already, even in lab one, is that the sample input and output is not sufficient to test your code. Just because it passes the sample input and output does not mean you've solved the problem. And that should be kind of obvious. Um, but it should also be obvious that it's necessary that you pass the sample input and output. I actually saw people uh, in our first lab in the course uh, submitting problems that failed the uh, sample input on the very first problem in the very first lab. Um, and so if you write a program, first check it against the sample that's been given to you. Uh, if you need to, you can like cut and paste the sample, uh, uh, you know, into, I'll, I'll just say it's sometimes helpful to create files that have the sample input and output, and then redirect those files. If you're on a, on a Unix-based system, you can even do it uh, through a command prompt. Uh, it's a little bit trickier if you're using something like Visual Studio, but, um, but anyway, uh, it, in the worst case, just do a cut and paste, standard cut and paste with your mouse uh, uh, to get stuff in or just type it in. Uh, but you want to make sure that you pass the sample input and output. Um, sometimes, especially if you have something that uh, is requiring multiple cases, 
Uh, I've seen many, many times where people forget to reinitialize data. You know, you might have 10 cases that you're supposed to handle and you, they forget to reinitialize from one case to the next. And so any one case works great. Uh, but then when you try to do three or four cases, somewhere along the way, something you did previously causes a problem with the later one. Um, so if you'd started or did them in a different order, it might not matter. Uh, but, but a simple way of sometimes catch, catching some of those initialization errors is just double a test case. So if, you know, the sample input only gives you one, they'll try doing something with two, and you can use the exact same one twice, and sometimes that'll help you catch things. Um, not always, but that's at least a, a way to do it. Another thing is to identify corner cases or edge cases, and this means the extreme ranges of input. Uh, many times you'll, if you look at the input, you'll say, oh, I forgot to handle the case where n is equal to one. You know, what if I have to sort an array and I've only got one element in the array? Well, did you write your sorting routine correctly to handle a single element? Did you did you remember that case? That's an example of a, of a corner case or an edge case. Um, so make sure that your code is capable of handling both the maximum and the minimum. It's sometimes hard to test the maximum because those can be really large data sets. Um, but the minimum you can usually test on your own. Make sure that you can handle the case where there's just one or two of something. I've had many times when I've written programs and I'm not being super careful and I forget to handle the simple cases at the low end. And sure enough, I test it and then that's where my code breaks. Um, I identified the variations in different cases. So uh, if you have, if you have, you know, one, two, three, or four cases in a row, um, make sure that you know like what basically what the differences are in all of those things um yeah okay last plan to handle large cases uh, i said it's sometimes really difficult to actually write the data set to do that i will say if you have a really tough problem and you're working on a weekly problem set you might want to generate one of the big test data sets uh, so that you can really test your code on something large um, but you at least need to make sure that your code is not going to break when it reads in something large make sure you can handle you know if you're creating an array make sure your array can be large enough to handle the data set uh, make sure that uh, you're not doing something that's like an n-cubed algorithm if the numbers are too big or something uh, so so just make sure that you can handle large data sets um, there are some common pitfalls that I see uh, there that are usually easier to avoid um, so just these are the simple things one make sure you initialize your variable uh, many times things will work on your own machine but if you forget to initialize your variables that doesn't necessarily work once it runs on Caddis. And so you say, it's working fine for me, it doesn't work there. Often it's a lack of initializing variables is the case for that. Um, remember to remove debugging code. Often you put in extra print statements or you put in you know some sort of error statement and that can cause issues when you run the code uh, that it, on, the, on the other system just because those things are being printed out. So if you have any extra print statements or you put in any error codes or anything like that, uh, you might wanna disable them. In fact, you probably wanna disable them before you submit. Um, the other thing, and this is kind of obvious, but read the instructions. Uh, sometimes it will ask for things that aren't really obvious at first. Like it might say, uh, on the output, output in sorted order. And if you miss that little in sorted order, you might have a great solution to the problem and you just didn't sort it correctly in terms of the output. Um, or maybe there's a special output that's needed in some cases, like, oh, if something fails, then write this particular phrase. And if you don't write it correctly, maybe you misspell something or you use the wrong punctuation, it's not going to uh, get judged as correct. So check those little things and check through the instructions. Make sure you haven't just missed what it's asking for. Many, many times in class, I've seen students who are convinced they have a program that's correct, and basically it is, uh, but they didn't read something simple about the way to output it or the way to, to you know, write something, and, and they miss that. Um, and again, like I said before, make sure it works on the sample code. Okay. Now I wanna go through just a little bit about what the different responses that you can get are and what they mean. So kind of the obvious one is if you get an accepted, that means, hey, great, you got it, you passed all the test cases, um, and, uh, and it all finished within the time limit, you get credit for the problem, and, and so on. 
Uh, if you get a compile error, that means that you tried to do something that the language doesn't support. And the usual case that I've seen there is when someone tries to import a library that is not a standard library. Um, so, especially in Python, but sometimes C++ or header files or something, if you are trying to use a library that's not a standard part of the language, uh, you'll often get a compile error at that point. So if it can't compile the code, that's a problem. Now there's other reasons people have compile errors. Maybe they did a cut and paste and they, you know, left something out or whatever, but, um, but anyway, that's, that's what that'll refer to. Um, if you get a wrong answer, Kind of obviously, this means you didn't pass a test case. Um, now, in CADIS, for our class, you can see usually what test case you failed on. I believe it shows that to you. Um, that is not always the case in other competitive programming environments. Sometimes it just tells you, nope, you got a wrong answer somewhere. Um, but at least in our case, you can usually see how many different cases you passed. Like, you know, oh, I failed on the 10th one or whatever. Um, and one thing to realize about that is the first few test cases are the sample test cases. So if you look at your output and it fails on the very first one, uh, that means that it failed on sample input. Um, so make sure that things were working for the sample input or check to make sure that you didn't do something silly like, um, you know, not initialize a variable or, or something like that. Uh, so uh, just be aware of that. You can also kind of figure out if you've made progress over your previous time or not. You know, sometimes if you get a little bit farther, even if you're still getting a wrong answer, it means, oh, you fixed one bug, but there's still another one later. Now, the typical problems, I mean, this could be almost anything that gives you a wrong answer, but, you know, you might have missed an edge case. Uh, another common thing is people have typos, especially if you cut and paste code from one section and you forget to change something. I can't tell you how many times I've done this in my own coding. Um, I copy a line or a set of lines from somewhere and I, you know, I change all of the A's to B's. And I miss one and I forget to change it. And maybe you don't even run into that case except occasionally. Um, the most common reason though, of course, is that you didn't think through the problem fully. There's something that you just weren't thinking about, either some types of cases you weren't handling or you weren't handling the more complex cases or whatever. Um, just remember, just because you pass the sample doesn't mean your code is working. Um, you know, it's great that you pass the sample, but that's just the first step in the whole thing working. Now, if you get a time limit exceeded, this means that your solution was still running when the time limit was reached. And there could be a few reasons for that. So you might have something that's a correct solution that would give the right answer if it just finished. Um, but it's just too slow. Um, or it might be a wrong solution. You don't actually really know that for sure. Uh, you might have an error that's an infinite loop. You know, you might have gotten into something that really is an infinite loop. Uh, if you have something that you're pretty sure the data size is not too large and you're getting a TLE, then almost certainly you hit an infinite loop. Um, but usually, usually when you get a TLE, that means that you have a method that's asymptotically too slow. Uh, and what that usually means is that you have to find a better algorithm. So if you get a time limit exceeded, what that means is first check and make sure you didn't do something kind of silly, like, you know, uh, uh, get yourself into an infinite loop. Check your loops, make sure that they're really not going to go into an infinite loop. Um, I've had times when, for instance, in a loop, I forget to read in the next piece of input at the end of it. I, you know, I forget a, a basic part, and so it never progresses beyond the first one. Um, so... Uh, so, you know, check that first, uh, but more often uh, that means that, oh, you've got something that's too inefficient. You know, for instance, you're using an n squared algorithm and you need something that's at least n log n. Uh, and so if that's the case, you might, you'll, you might need to approach the problem differently. So typically that's going to be the, the solution when you have a TLE. I'll mention that occasionally and it's, it's not as common, but occasionally the language you're using makes a difference. And so this is particularly true if you get a TLE and it's in Python and you're pretty sure you have a good solution. Uh, you can try doing it in C++ instead or Java and see if that uh, improves things. So occasionally that's the case. That's not the typical reason that people get TLE. Um, there's also a memory limit exceeded. This is pretty rare. People usually don't encounter this. More commonly, they'll get a TLE before they get an MLE. Um, but occasionally, if they have something that's got a memory leak or they're doing too much dynamic allocation, like too large of an array, or they get a dictionary that's too large. Later, when we talk about dynamic programming, this comes up 
uh, you know, I've seen I've seen memory limit exceeded the most in dynamic programming type problems. Uh, so that will occasionally come up. You might never encounter this, but but a few students do every semester. Okay, um, then the other one is you get a runtime error. And a runtime error, what that means is the program either crashed or it threw an exception. It finished with a non-zero error code. Um, and so something happened while it was running. And I'll tell you the most common reasons that you run into for this. So one is array out of bounds access. So if you get a runtime error, good chance there's an array out of bounds. Um, so make sure that you weren't accessing something out of bounds. Um, if you have an uninitialized variable, that can cause a, a runtime error. Typically, it just gives you wrong answers when you do that, but sometimes it'll give you a runtime error. Uh, if you have a stack call depth that's too large, so especially if you have a routine that's recursive and so something keeps getting called, well, there's always a limit in how deep the call stack can get. Um, and I don't remember what it is. In, uh, you can... In Python, I believe you can actually reset what that call stack limit is, and I've seen people do that in their code to get it to pass. Um, but you have to be careful about that because you're likely to run into memory limits or time limit even if you do that. Um, but basically, the point is you can only make so many levels of function calls deep, and that kind of prevents thing, you know, basically prevents the stack overflow from overflowing in the in the computer. So uh, you don't want to have uh, you don't want to have too many function calls one after the other. Um, another one kind of obvious is division by zero. If you have something where you're doing numerical calculations, make sure you're not dividing by zero. That'll lead to a runtime error. Um, and then the other one that surprisingly maybe comes up as a runtime error is if you ever try to do a static allocation of too much memory. Um, and so you, you know, declare something and you say, oh, I need to have X amount of memory, uh, and if you're, you know, I think the limit is around a megabyte or something, but not, you know, it's probably more than a megabyte, but something like a million uh, integers, I think is the usual limit that they have. I don't remember for sure, but if you're trying to allocate too much memory at once, uh, it'll show up as a runtime error, and I'll mention that this is very system dependent. So I've had code before where I have things that run just fine on my own system, uh, and then I submit it to an online judge, and it exceeds whatever they have the settings for on their system and I get a runtime error out of it. And if I just lower that, uh, that, that memory allocation, it works fine. Um, it's less common now because people don't use pointers as much as they used to, but uh, there's all sorts of issues that can come up that cause runtime errors related to pointers. And anytime you're, you're dereferencing stuff, uh, you can at least, this is a, there, there, are, oppor there are always opportunities to uh, getting runtime errors here. Um, I will mention one thing, just since it's sort of related to this, that in C++, uh, some people are used to accessing elements of a vector with dot at and then I for the index, uh, but, and when you do that, it does bounds checking for you, and you can catch exceptions, and you can do some nice stuff with that, um, and that's actually often a good way to program, uh, but it's also less efficient, because it's doing error bounds checking, it's also, that takes time. It means every anytime you're accessing a memory element, it's checking to make sure that you're accessing something that's within the bounds. Uh, if you just use the square brackets to access elements, it's usually faster, but it's not doing any bounds checking. Okay, so, uh, so just keep that in mind. Often for efficiency, you wanna use the square brackets. Okay, so um, that's all I had for this. I will mention one other thing, uh, which is if and when you get the book, uh, if you if you get the textbook, the textbook has a whole lot of exercises to review and solutions for many of them are actually in the book. So I would really encourage you if you're interested in like just improving your skills, uh, go through them and try them yourself. I'll I'll just say you will not be able to go through an answer like even in chapter one. There are going to be questions in there that you will not know the answer to. That's that's not the point. The point is to let some of those. It's to judge how much you already know and don't know and self judge them.
Okay. Um, but if you learn the things in the exercises, once you know them, you will become much better overall. So if you're just interested in improving your skills, improving your knowledge, going through the textbook and, and looking at the exercises that are there and then the solutions for, for them is a good way of improving your knowledge. Uh, it's just as additional study. It's not going to be a, something that we assign in this class. Um, and if in particular, a good practice of some kind of programming fundamentals, some sort of basic skills that are useful in a lot of competitive programming uh, is to go through in the new book it's 1.3.4.1 they really like the uh, uh, sub numbering here uh, in book three if you have the the third edition book uh, as opposed to the fourth edition it was uh, exercise 1.2.3 and then the solution is in section 1.7 of the fourth edition or 1.5 of the third edition um, so if you want something that's a good practice do that try it on your own and then check your answer in the back um, you know it says hey how would you do such and such in java how might you do this in python and so on um, and the more you work to make sure you understand the implementations and potentially reproduce them on your own uh, the better off you'll, you'll be Okay, so that's all I have for this particular uh, lesson. Like I said, for a second part this week, I will probably do a second recording going over some basic data structures, and, uh, and you'll, that'll also be available online.